Hello everyone, today is Thursday, June 12, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I think you can see that I really do mean it. Got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on oh, some Mountain Dew. I'm actually out of Mountain Dew, two weeks running, we're going to have to substitute a Diet Coke in. So hey, Coca-Cola out there, if you want me to promote your, uh, your product here, I'd be happy to do that. Coke fizzes a lot. I gotta wait for the fizz to go down. There was an article on Yahoo saying that uh, stewardesses don't like it. Can you call them that now? Flight attendants. I guess you can call them flight flight attendants now. They don't like it because it fizzes too much. Um. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. Uh, there's a disclaimer screen. I could sum it up really quick. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. This is a part of the show where I beg for a review on Amazon. And the reason I do this is because, as I say each week, you get a couple stinkers out there. And I'm okay with somebody uh, with a little constructive criticism. Somebody gave me a three because they said it was too much work. And, oh, well, it is what it is. It is work. I never said it was easy. And I never implied it was easy. Uh, but I understand why they gave me a three or whatever, three stars. But the people that give you one star and just review the other reviews, I think they're just, um, there's something mentally wrong with them. So a good review helps to balance that out. And we'll leave that where it is. So what do we talk about? Well, I want to follow up a little bit about on discretion from last week. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that because I have a lot I do want to cover when it comes to IPOs this week. As you know, I have an upcoming webinar on IPOs, and I've been talking a lot about IPOs last few weeks. So without telling you what I'm going to tell you, let's just, kind of hop into things. Um, just hold off on your stock questions till we get to the charts, and then um, I'm going to pull up my telechart, that is. And then also, uh, if you don't mind, ask about one stock hit return or carriage return, whatever they call it now. And um, ask about another if you want, but don't put six on one line because I won't be able to figure out which ones I've already covered and which ones I haven't. So that's just a simple ground rules. Ideally, you want to be asking me about trending stocks. Otherwise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you up a little bit because we do trade trends as you probably should know. If not, after a few shows, you'll get it. Um, last week, we talked about stop nicks, and stop nick is when you get a, a stock and it begins to take off, or it might not even take off, but it comes back in, it kind of nicks your stop, and then, of course, it takes off without you. Well, if you have a hard stop in the market, I get this question over and over again. If you have a hard stop, yeah, it's going to take you out. Uh, a couple things you could do. One thing I didn't mention last week that's just coming to my mind this week, uh, I realize I forgot to mention it. Yeah, sometimes you could have a contingency order, and we keep I keep going back to that situation where we had where uh, we just got barely nicked on one, and then it went up about another 400%. Uh, in a case like that, uh, where you if you want to use a contingency order where you're not actually watching the screen, and different brokerages have them, so you're going to have to figure them out on your own. Probably the easiest thing to do is to write a little simple algorithm uh, in other words, write out what you want to do logically and then figure out what boxes to check and what numbers to put where, which is broker. Um, so I don't want to open up the can of worms, and, and so I have to help each of you individually with all your different brokerages. But there are some discretionary or I should say contingency orders you could put in. You could say something like um, the stock for like a long must trade, last trade I guess would be uh, below the stop. And the bid, the BID, would have to be less than the stop, okay? Uh, and that way, you know it's a true market, okay? Or maybe even the ask could be less than the stop. Just kind of noodle with it a little bit if you want to use a discretionary order. Uh, the main thing I would say is if the stop gets hit, it gets hit. And get ready to get out of the stock. But if it doesn't keep dropping and turns around and goes right back up, it stay with. An example we used was Zen from last week. And the point is, if you get a few of these with just a very minor, minor additional risk, and you don't let it get away from you, and you get a few of these that actually turn around, then that can make all the difference in the world. So we're down around 14 and Zen. And if you follow up on Zen, as of yesterday, it was trading over 18. So percentage-wise, that's a huge difference. They won't always come back, believe me, but sometimes they do. 
By the way, this was kind of a back-to-the-well type of setup. For those who got stopped out mechanically, I still like the setup. I still think it has potential, and that's why I, I re-recommended it in the service, and it triggered uh, a couple days ago. And so far, so good today, notwithstanding. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of this because we spent a lot of time in this last week. Go in and watch last week's show if you want to know more on this. But a couple of things just to throw out. Realize that you want to catch the occasional outlier, and the more trades that you can stay with through a stop, Dick, the better your chances are of catching that occasional outlier. And that one stock that goes up 500% could give you a huge return on your portfolio. Uh, obviously, you want to have an uncle point, and you don't want to throw caution to the wind. And again, go in and watch um, last week's show for more on that. I woke up early this morning thinking about the, the last bull market in IPOs, and I have the last in quotes for a variety of reasons. Uh, back in December, and last November, when I was putting together, even October, when I was putting together my stock selection webinar, when I got to the IPO section, and that's something I've been working on for about a year or so seriously, and before that, on and off for, for maybe 10 years, I've been studying IPOs, and maybe even longer than that, maybe all the way back, well, yeah, all the way back until, geez, I'm showing my age, <laughs> over 15 years or so, but... I got real serious with it over the last year or so, um, and I'm doing a lot of writing about it. Nothing that I've published just yet, but been working on. And that all came out, or some of that, I should say, came out in the stock selection webinar. And I wanted to do more follow-up on it, and I just kept thinking, you know, we're in this rip-roaring bull market in these IPOs. Uh, as soon as I come out and do something with IPOs, I'm gonna, my timing is going to be awful. And I'm going to hit a bear market in IPOs or a bear market, period. And uh, recently I got to thinking, so what? Okay, there will be more bull markets in IPOs. And I'm going to flesh that out in a little more detail. But let's take a look at what I've seen uh, back last fall and, and even uh, earlier this year because we did see some nice follow through. And here's one from March, you can see. And had a nice little takeoff in here and come back in. Now, keep in mind, we talked about IPOs. A lot of them do this fly and die pattern, which we'll talk about in just one second, a little bit more detail. But one aspect of IPOs is, as I talked about in being a technician's dream a few weeks back, if A is less than B and B is less than C, and a market is going to go from A to C, it's going to have to pass through B first. Now, this doesn't. There's no guarantee when a market passes through B, it's not going to stop and come back in. But it will have to go through B if it is going to C. And so, based on this, the this is the most basic rule of technical analysis. So, based on this most basic rule, I started studying IPOs uh, many years ago, and I've discovered there are some breakout characteristics to them that don't work, it wouldn't work at IBM or an efficient stock. It's something well known because everybody's got a quote screen on their desk. Everybody would see it. But at some of these more thinner IPOs or just even some of the thicker IPOs, in fact, like Twitter, I'll show you one second here, uh, it can work because there's a euphoria behind them and they tend to trade purely on emotion. So this ABC pattern can work. Here's another example. If you were playing a breakout, you might have got triggered in here, or you actually could have even been triggered in a little earlier. If you're just playing some generic pullbacks along the way, uh, you could be a little bit more lenient in your pullbacks when you're trading something like an IPO because there is a euphoria. And But notice that as I was putting these slides together, I noticed that I was surprised at how many of these came right back in. Here's another example. You could use a breakout characteristic with this one. Nice little rally up, but then, of course, it comes right back in. Yeah, this Gobo, there were some very early trend patterns way back here, uh, possible deep pullbacks and all, but you can see for the most part it had a pretty good run and pretty much doubled in price. And I'm just showing you the ones that doubled or at least 
came close to doubling, and these are just some from the last year. I weeded out the super thin ones. I'll talk a little bit about volume. Oh, let me just get on volume well, before I forget. Somebody emailed me wanting to know about volume. Well, it's going to be hard to get enough volume in IPOs. And let me rephrase that. In the core methodology, we like to see about 500,000 shares or more, okay? And then if there is a top, and it's probably 2 million or so, but I will never throw a stock out just because it's high volume, but that might be one of the criteria. Well, in a lot of these new issues, it's hard to get enough volume to trade, but as a private trader, you can trade those as long as you've got a few six-figure days and even 50,000, 100,000 share days in there. So at least you have some liquidity. Now, I know that's not much, and that's a lot less than we're normally looking at, but as long as you have some liquidity, then it's okay to trade. you got to realize I wear many hats, and, and I, I am a private trader, and I do take some of these more speculative trades sometimes, and IPOs is something that I like to trade on a more speculative basis. So I am going in to those thinner issues when it comes to IPOs. The core methodology, I do like to stick with the, like I said, 500K, and then maybe dip a little bit below that, maybe between 250K and 500K. When it gets below that, then it starts getting a little bit dangerous, more dangerous, I should say, um, for the core methodology. And also, in wearing many hats, I do some things where, like the core service, I like to be able to put it out there as something that's repeatable for maybe some small I, uh, RIAs, uh, registered investment advisors, to be able to look at that and get some fodder for their research. Uh, on occasion, they tell me, hey, Dave, I love that little hot stock you picked, but it was a little bit too thin. So I try to give stocks that are thick enough for those guys, at least enough of them, and then I also consider the private trader uh, with that. And, that. and obviously, if I'm doing something on an institutional level, then the stocks are going to be even more thick. But the beauty of these IPOs is that you can come in as a private trader and trade them uh, but just know that it's, it could be a bumpy ride because the low in volume, they can get pushed around a lot, but that can be used to your advantage. Uh, here's another one, a little breakout characteristic here, and you got a nice little trend out of it, almost a double, I think just about a double. But it did come back in, and again, we're going to talk about that, the, the uh, pattern in just one second. I call it the fly and the die. Uh, yet another one, bit of a breakout pattern. Some pullback characteristics along the way, but it had a pretty good run in here. Uh, again, a double. This RLYP, it's some of you guys might recognize it from the service. Uh, generic pullback would have triggered around here. Uh, some early trend stuff would have triggered here, and then you could, you could add secondary signals throughout. And you got a pretty good run in that before it began to come back in and correct in a more serious manner. RSPP, same sort of deal. Nice little run there. And they're just kind of consolidating sideways. T-Log, get a little breakout here, blast higher, nice little pullback here, blast higher, and then just kind of fizzled out from there, okay? So when I put my slides together, I was surprised at how many of them had, had, had the fly and the die characteristics. So it's like it, it, it's making me wonder, is this the last bull market in IPOs? And the answer, I think, is no. And is it the last meaning that, is it done? And I think the answer to that is no, too. I think we're still or in an IPO bull market, at least for now. And even if we're not, there will be new fads in the future. The other thing is technology is moving so fast in this day and age that I think we're going to have a tremendous amount of technology IPOs. And then I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, even we'll have probably even more fads due to the interconnectivity of the internet and all the media out there. So fads I think will spread a lot faster. So there will be, even if this is the quote unquote last bull market, there will be new fads and new technology and pockets of strength at least in IPOs. And then I think there's also going to be plenty of flies and dies at the least. I think they will always continue to exist. Now, as I said a few weeks ago, IPOs can be self-policing. So if we do get into a bit of a, God forbid, bear market or extended uh, choppy period, 
then fewer and fewer companies will come public and there'll be less to do, but that's okay because it'll force you to sit on your hands a little bit. And there might be times where you might need to incorporate a little bit of market timing into your thinking, okay? For now, I'm not so worried about the market timing, but I would imagine that some of these breakout strategies, just knowing markets, and have because I've been around for a while and just looking at them, I'm not smarter than anyone else. I'm just looking at it a lot. I'm just looking at it every day. It's kind of like John said, you know, you're going to find that, that once you start achieving a little bit of success, you'll realize you're not smarter than anybody else. You just kind of stuck with it. And he says a little bit more eloquent than me. Um, and then the other thing to I thought about a lot from a philosophical standpoint, and, and, and me, I was trying to get my timing perfect and wanted to look like a genius. And I always want to do that. Like when I did a stock selection webinar, I was really nervous about my timing because I wanted to look like a genius. And luckily, and there were a few IPOs in, in that Landry list that really helped us out. AERI, I think, was one of them, RL. YPP or whatever one we just looked at was another one in that list, uh, just so happened to show up at that list. And those stocks took off. So I, I was able to go back and say, hey, see, I showed you how to pick stocks. These are stocks I picked, and it took off. And so that's my kind of mentality. I want to look great at doing this. And the other thing I thought about, though, is like, well, even if this is the last, so to speak, with quotes, bull market, there will be more, and that information – is going to be very useful, and I'm doing a little, um, I'm doing a little background research just to kind of have a little fodder, not necessarily anything you can trade off of, but I was doing a little research, and, and there were IPOs going way back to the 1600s in Louisiana. There was like the Louisiana, Louisiana Corporation or something, the 1600s, which was going to, uh, the big hype there was going to, there was a bubble about developing the Mississippi Delta. Uh, there's been bank IPOs. There's been canal IPOs when he started cutting the canals between the lakes. And then uh, obviously in more recent times or fairly recent times it's been there was the internet bubble in the IPOs and then there were certain uh, technology revolutions and then there were solar IPOs and so there's going to continue to be new fads and new technology so the best time to plant a tree obviously is always 20 years ago but the second best time to plant a tree is today so learn how to recognize these patterns and study these markets. And even if that IPO market, bull market, dies today, at least when those stocks start coming around a few months from now or even a few years from now, you'll recognize that next bubble is in place and begin to play it. Now, I'm using terms, I'm throwing out a lot of terms like bubble and fad and things like that because a lot of the times, as you just saw, with an IPO, they tend to fly and die. In fact, I've identified four patterns that are that are the most common patterns. And probably out of those four, the most common of the most common is the fly and the die. And I'm not going to go get into a lot of reasons for this, but there's a couple of reasons uh, that I'll just mention real quickly. There's a holding period in here uh, for people and that could be up to 180 days for insiders to sell. There's a discouraging of the flippers, and I'm not sure how long that period could be, as long as possible. If you are back here before the IPO becomes public, let's call it BPO, before public offering, then you might be able to get some shares from your underwriter, okay, from the underwriter or whatever, from your brokerage. So they might encourage you not to flip them, and certainly – You've got the, the underwriter in here, underwriter, W-R-I-T-E-R. you got the underwriter in here, and he's got his syndicate, so he'll pass some of that risk off to other people, okay, smaller brokerages or whatever, other financial firms. And so all of these people are going to be encouraged not to flip the IPO because they're going to want to see it successful. If you end up with a situation where the IPO just flops, then companies are going to be less likely to use that underwriter. Somebody emailed me a few days ago, or I guess about a week now. My days have kind of all blurred together. I've been so busy. but uh, And they were ask me, does it matter who the underwriter is? And my answer is always going to be the same when you ask me a question about fundamentals or behind the scenes or whatever. My answer is always going to be, well, the market is the final arbiter. And if you've got a great-looking setup in the market, then you follow that great-looking setup and it, don't confuse the issue with too many facts. But 
from an academic standpoint, there probably is a better success rate with certain underwriters than other underwriters. But before I digress too far, just know that you have a quiet period that lasts so long, about 25 days, I believe, if memory serves. You have insiders in here. So there's no bad news flowing into the market. And also with that quiet period, when that quiet period ends, guess what? The first news, the first company report that comes out is going to be what? Good news, okay? Because all this stuff is set up behind the scenes. And if they do it properly, they set this thing up to fly. It's a lot of good news. It's a lot of good things happening. People can't bail out. So if they do it right, now there's more than one pattern. Obviously, sometimes they flop. So, so, but we're not going to get into that at this particular moment. So the most common pattern is the fly because they set the IPOs up for success ahead of time. And then you often get the die afterwards. And this is where money management comes in. But this is a great time to trade. And you can make a lot of money in that fly phase. And as you just saw, some of these issues could go up well over 100% in that phase. So it's definitely worth trading. Now, I had this slide in here uh, last week. in a couple of weeks before, and I was going to make a bunch of different ones of these. Uh, the reason we use it as sardine is um, the old adage about the cans of sardines, trading sardines. I know some of you guys are going to roll your eyes because you probably know it already because I've talked about it for the last six weeks. But the old story is the sardine prices were getting higher and higher, and it was a bubble in sardines, and people were trading, trading mean the keyword, tens of sardines, and the price was just going through the roof, and then one guy decides he's going to have an expensive lunch, opens up his sardines, and finds out they're rotten. He tracks out the guy he bought them from, complains, and he says, ah, you silly fool, those sardines were for trading and not eating, okay? So you need to think of these IPOs just like you would think of any other stock, okay? If they work, great, but if they don't, uh, you got to get rid of them as soon as they begin to smell. So you do have this enthusiasm which pushes into the market, and sometimes that enthusiasm can increase. And this can shift, obviously, to the left a little bit, but you kind of get the idea. The enthusiasm begins to wane. It might have a little lag with the price. The price begins to wane, and then the reality can begin to set in. And when the reality begins to set in, this is kind of like the fly and die, and this is where you have the most common pattern, okay? Jonathan says, do you think the technicals to be identifiable during the fly period, or is it just go to the 90s internet bubble type of trading all over the place, in other words? No, there's structure, okay? And I'm not going to point out all the structure in, in these. I mean, I, I am giving you, truth be told, a little bit of a teaser here, and hopefully you'll come to the uh, the, the, uh, the big webinar where I'll show you what the structure is. Uh, it it if you want, go in and study them on your own and, and see if you can figure it out on your own, uh, by all means. But the webinar is cheap. Uh, and it's cheap, good information for cheap. So, yeah, you don't just willy-nilly buy. There's quite a few things, and there's quite a few rules that I've developed that will help uh, keep you out of trouble. And there's also some thinking that you're going to need, which some of which I can tell you now, is that if you are trading certain, let's say you're trading these, these breakout patterns that I've discovered, uh, the ABC pattern, okay? If you're trading that ABC pattern, there are certain rules that you're going to need to know to pick the best of the best so you don't end up with a die and die. Uh, you don't end up with a flop. And if those patterns stop working or you start getting a few losses, there are some things you need to know that maybe – conditions have changed and know when to back off a, a little bit. So I know I kind of oversimplified it, like, hey, just buy it, D. But there's a little bit more to it than that that you will see. Now, one thing that I did call out on my list that I created earlier this morning was the ones that are still looking pretty good. Now, these, these might still be in the fly phase, and they just haven't died yet. So maybe it's not the last bull market. Maybe there is still a bull market and some IPOs. And here's an issue that took off. It had a pretty serious consolidation in here, but then it took off again. Okay, and here's one, and we're actually long this one. This is Rice, R-I-C-E. And so far, it's just uh, it hadn't set the world on fire, but it's had a pretty good run. 
from the open. Uh, here's another one you can see so far it's going straight up. This is a current chart. This is as of today, or as of yesterday, I should say. Uh, True, here's another one so far. And then Tour, which had some really cool patterns back here uh, right before it took off. That's another great one. And then Zen, we're actually long Zen. Zen made new highs yesterday, so that's a good thing. And so far, today notwithstanding, but so far, the uh, trend certainly looks like it's higher on that one, okay? Do you think at some point in the near future, laws will change and you will be able to short IPOs? Um, You know, that's, that, uh, Fred, that's speculative. I mean, I don't know how you would... Um, you would talk about that. I'm not sure exactly when the, um, and I'll find out um, because that could be a possibility. The only problem is it's kind of dangerous to short these IPOs because I think you're much better going long. The, the, the odds are stacked to go long the IPOs, but a lot of times they just come out and they die. But you cannot short an IPO early in the process unless you are an institution or, or some sort of insider that has uh, permission to do so because it cannot be borrowed uh, and it cannot be lent to the retail crowd. Now, when when that gets lifted, um, I don't know. In fact, let me make a note here uh, to look into that. Um, it's something that I – two things. One, it's something that I thought about – but because most of these are so thin, it would be very dangerous to do, and that's not the that's not the crux or the bread and butter of how to really make money on these guys. Um, but it is it is something that has crossed my mind, obviously. And the the second point I want to make is from doing this research and putting together this webinar, which just keeps growing by the day. And that's the beauty of what I do. It's, it forces me to do research, and then as I'm doing research, it just leads to more and more ideas. Uh, so I love what I, I mean. I, I'm flattered that I get paid for what I do, but I think I have something that's worth sharing. And, and the more I research, the more I find. So maybe that's fodder for additional research. And I'm going to throw out some bigger picture patterns within IPOs that look like they're pretty incredible. And it's something that it's really not more forte to trade in this particular manner but it looks like they work, so I'm either going to have to readjust my thinking on this or give it to you guys, and you guys decide whether or not you want to trade some of these bigger picture patterns. So it's thrown off some fodder for research, and one of them is, yes, due to the amount of fly and die, is there a chance to actually short the IPO? Somebody was asking me yesterday, I was doing a webinar, and I talked a little bit about this, and they wanted to know, like, when did they become optionable? And that's a thing. It depends. It would have to be a very thick stock, and there's, there's a while before they become uh, optionable. So, that, in fact, that's another one, thing we can, I could look into, how long before optional. Um, the main thing I've identified, though, is that as long as they are in the, the early IPO phase, okay, You've got the quiet period, and then you've got the quiet period, which brings good news. Wow, lo and behold, you know, nobody brings the company public, and then 25 days later says, ah, it's really kind of sucks. We really didn't mean to bring it public. You know, they're going to have some glowing report, which was written <laughs> 30 days ago, okay? And then um, and you can't, and a lot of, um, there's not as much noise. There's the euphoria, and there's the manipulation that all comes within the first leg, and that's the main thing we're looking into. Now, uh, I have studied and looked at fairly recent and not so recent IPOs, and I call them toddlers, uh, like one or two year old companies. And as long as they don't implode, as long as they stick around, there's still some uh, very good characteristics about them. You don't necessarily want to trade the breakouts. In them, and that's where the core methodology comes in in trading these toddlers, some of these companies that haven't been around forever but are, are beginning to show some promise and are beginning to set up. Again, maybe stocks, that, like again, like toddlers, just think of like a toddler being a couple years old, just think of these stocks being a couple years old. But again, the crux of what we're doing is to capitalize on the promise of the future. Obviously, with the fly and then the die is the promise 
does not materialize, okay? I think it's been 30, it, take, it takes 30 or 60 days to be lifted. Yeah, and then after that, after that, that how long, it whatever it is, 30 to 60 days before you can short, uh, you know, can you borrow the shares? That's going to be the next problem. Now, you can check with your broker. Uh, there's some little tools on the Internet um, to, to find. Different brokers have little little tools, and you can, you can plug the stock symbol in, and it'll tell you whether they have shares or not. So finding the shares can be tough. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of crazy. I'll recommend a stock on the service. That trades well over half a million shares a day, and I'll go to my little brokerage tool, and, and there will be four million shares available. And I'll have people email me and say, "Dave couldn't get it. Uh, they just, they just my broker, my broker didn't have any shares." Where it seems like this other broker had four million shares, so you think there was plenty to go around. So I would imagine that would be a nightmare if you were trying to do something like an IPO. So yeah, I could probably come out and show you these great, and wonderful IPOs. And say, hey, let's short them right here. And I would look like a friggin' genius, but the reality is that's not real money. And I don't want to show you anything where you could not make real money. Okay? And that's the repeatability thing I'm always talking about. Uh, is that that I want to show you something that you could actually go home and, and from the privacy of your own home or the privacy of your own uh, PD, uh, PDA, whatever. Um, what did I say? PD smartphone. Uh, wherever you are, you could you could uh, implement these strategies. Do you short these in the die phase, Gene? Yeah, can you? Yeah, that's the thing we're talking about, Gene. Is uh, one, they're going to be thin. Two, they're going to be hard to borrow. Uh, three, you have a hold up period before you can borrow them. So we're mostly focused on that euphoric phase, on the promise of the future, and that's why I decided it. it I'm horrible with name. When it comes to names, I, I try to come up with with something to be as is as, as, uh, concise as possible, but I always come up with a big old name for something. So I, you know, uh, capitalizing on the promise of the future is what I've called the uh, uh, the webinar. Um, I think it did. At least I have to look at the name. But uh, it. But that's what we're we're doing is we're trying to capitalize on that promise, on that excitement phase, and. And never forget that technical analysis is reading the emotions of the market. And you're going to have your most purest emotions in something that is newest to the market. And you're going to have the most euphoria and the most excitement in there. So that's the beauty of, of all that. So, yeah, short them, that's a difference. That's fodder for further out, and maybe we could, we could develop that in the IPO webinar part two. And when I, in case uh, – I don't know if I made this public or not, but if I do a webinar on something, if I do a repeat webinar, anybody who goes to the first webinar gets to go to the second webinar free. Okay, so if I discover a lot of stuff over the next couple of years and decide to do a webinar again on IPOs, I'll let you in for free if you go to this one. Okay, yeah, a lot of a lot of questions about the downside. Yeah, tough to again, tough to borrow. I don't want to beat the dead horse on that. Okay. Uh, will large, will the laws change? I don't know. Probably not. There's probably some. Uh, there's probably a good reason why there's no shorting in there. I believe in free markets, but maybe there's good reason why there's no shorting, um, it, because that could probably add to the manipulation or something. And yeah, I'm not really sure what the what the reason is. Okay, the question is good question. Do you stop looking at an IPO after a set point? Um, yes and no. Because you got to realize that once an IPO, see right now, my uh, the, it's just kind of a trick I discovered, and the way my database works is I, I look at things, and I set them up by 50-day HV, and then I'm looking at pullbacks. Okay. Well, anything with less than 50 days is going to get culled out of the system, of the tradable list. So this is 50 days. And then anything more than 50 days is go this way. So I call this my core methodology, okay, for the issues that are at least 50 days old. And then anything less than 50 days, I consider this an IPO, okay. Now, this is a bit arbitrary. You could use maybe 100 days in here because what I have found is that the, the stocks that are, you got, let's say 100 days would be considered a newbie. Newbie. Let's call these IPOs, one day to 150 days an IPO, 100 days a newbie, and then let's call anything greater than 100 days a toddler. 
Okay. So once it's more than 50 days, just the way I have my screen set up, it becomes for the core methodology. The breakout characteristics that I'm looking at occur after five days of trading. That's the first rule that I have. So between five and 50 days is a golden opportunity from what I've seen. But even up to 100 days and these newbies, I think you still have some ancillary type of setup. So I'm looking for maybe breakouts very early on in the first stage. And then the second stage, I'm looking for generic pullbacks. And in the third stage, I'm looking for just anything within the core methodology. Okay, so after, in fact, even after the breakout phase, I'm, I'm trading within the core methodology with some caveats. Okay, so I might be a little bit more lenient. So instead of uh, saying, oh, I won't take anything that's pulled back more than eight days, maybe I'll give them nine, 10, 11 days a little bit more because I think there's still that euphoria within. Whereas with an established stock, I'm thinking, eh. If it doesn't go after that period of time, then maybe it's not going to go. Now, the second point of question is, is there a point where a certain period where IPOs tend to fade into the sunset and the signals no longer come? Um, it depends on what pattern you're looking for, okay? If it's just a die, like if it's just die and die, then there was no patterns to begin with. If it's fly and it begins to die, it depends on whether or not this becomes this or if it begins to reverse at this level, okay? And that's giving away a third bigger picture pattern. And then there's a fourth bigger picture pattern that, in general, they just continue to rally, and then they could be wonderful trading in the toddler phase, okay? Meeting companies uh, half a year to one to two years old, okay? So good, uh, good questions. Uh, good, good question there. Okay, um, this is the official link to sign up for the webinar. So check that out when you get a chance. And there's some more information there. Um, and as I wrote last week, if we're just talking about the fly and die, money management and position management is important. That's something I'm going to really harp on. And again, once again, not to be the dead horse, but some breakout strategies can work quite well. Longer term, though, market conditions may dictate that. If we get into a market that gets choppy or a downtrend, uh, then those breakout strategies will not work as well. So you might want to wait for a little bit more market confirmation. But the good news is it's going to be self-regulating at that point, and there's going to be fewer and fewer IPOs. Um, Random thoughts are left over from a couple of weeks ago, but uh, nothing much has changed. Take things one day at a time. Let the market come to you. Wait for uh, the date. Listen to the database. There's been a lot of fake outs lately and all, but it looks like the market last couple of days notwithstanding is trying to get its act together. In fact, we're going to hop out and look at the overall market uh, real quick. Any questions, anything we've covered on slides so far before we get to the markets? Um, by the way, if you do get the stock, if you go in and get the stock selection webinar, uh, you'll get free access to, the, so that's the offer I'm going to throw out. If you get the stock selection webinar, you'll get the IPO webinar for free. So if you get this one, then this one's for free. Okay. And again, here's your link right here. It's just DaveLandry.com slash IPO dash webinar. Okay. And I'll bring you there. And there's a good information page on that. And I'll put some more information on the home page soon too. Okay. Any questions or anything on the slides? Um, just a couple little housekeeping things and then we'll hop into the charts. I have 2012 and 2013 weekend charts available. I've been getting a lot of interest in 2012 for some reason, and I'll have to go back and look at what we covered. So we must have covered some good stuff. Uh, somebody asked me a couple days ago some questions about risk versus reward, and I, you know, I, I I feel I don't know why I feel guilty, but it's like I told them flat out: look, we spent three or four hours talking about that, maybe even more, uh, last year in these in these chart shows, just like we just spent. 40 minutes talking about IPOs. So if you want to know more about that, get the recordings um, as opposed to me talking to you personally for three hours. Just not enough time in the day. Uh, anyway, our uh, first two books are still relevant. Check them out. And then I have uh, a trading service, as you know, with an introductory rate. You just go to the uh, trading service link on my website for more on that. Okay, let's um, hop into the overall 
charts. In fact, if you guys let me know if you have any final questions on anything we've covered so far. And if not, uh, as soon as I get through with the markets, in fact, you start asking now, we'll open it up for individual stock questions uh, now. So all questions, whether about individual stocks or about anything we've covered so far. Let's take a look at the overall market while we're waiting on questions. And there's a couple things I want to point out. Let's start with the P's and then um, work our way out. s and P's look pretty good so far. You can see we just kind of pulled back to the 10-day moving average. Let's get a clean chart in here. Uh, we had that, that horrible consolidation, which seemed like it went on forever. And then now we got a nice breakout. Now, we haven't seen a whole lot of new setups because as long as the market is at or really close to new highs, there's nothing that's pulled back just yet. But now we're getting a bit of a pullback. And it doesn't look too bad in the S&Ps. In fact, it actually looks healthy. I like the way it looks in the S&P. Unfortunately, the other indices, they didn't make it quite back to their old highs. Now, this is not the end of the world, and I don't want to fear monger, but I just want to kind of point it out to you. You can see that the NASDAQ stalled short of its prior highs in here. Now, the problem that I have, as I've talked about ad nauseum, is when you have a V-shaped recovery at high levels, by the time the market gets all the way back to its old highs, it's already overbought. So it's hard for it to make a new leg higher. If you have a consolidation, it's easy for it, or easier for it to make a new leg higher. For instance, let's just take a look at the P's real quick. What do we have in the P's? We had a nice little consolidation. So now the market's getting overbought, but who cares? It's had a pretty good run in here, and now it's just pulling back, and it might be primed to make another leg higher. Whereas in something like the NASDAQ, it's already overbought, so that next leg, it's going to be really hard for it to make a new leg on top of the old leg. Stranger things have happened, though, and that's why we take things one day at a time. Let's take a look at the Russell. And then I want to point out a couple of sectors in here. Uh, Russell, so far, not the end of the world. Just kind of pulling back a little bit in here. And like I said in the newsletter this morning, last night, to you guys on the service, internally the market has been a little stronger than the indices would suggest over the last couple of days. So it's not the end of the world. Now, some people concerned about the Russell saying that uh, I guess they dusted off Edwards and McGee. And it's like, wait a minute, that looks like a head and shoulders. It might be, but I don't trade a big picture technical analysis pattern in and of itself. I trade bow ties and reversal gaps and first thrusts and gatekeepers and all these other patterns. And ideally, I can combine that with a bigger picture pattern. So for me to get excited or worried about the Russell being a head and shoulders top, it would actually have to set up with one of my setups and trigger before I got to worried about it, before I began to worry about it. Now, shorter term, again, it looks okay. Like the other indices, it's, it's had a nice leg higher, pulling back a little bit. Longer term, though, I sure would like to see it bust out to brand new highs and not look back for a while and then maybe have some orderly corrections. So I want to see this, obviously, and then some of that before I get too excited about the Russell. So, yeah, you need to be cautious based on the action in the Russell and the NASDAQ. And the S&P certainly does look pretty darn good. Uh, semiconductors, I guess today notwithstanding, and maybe by the end of the day, yeah, look, we're, we're back in black here. Semiconductors looking pretty good in here. Selected areas uh, of within, like, the energies are looking pretty good here. One thing a little concerning is utilities are beginning to implode, as you can see. Um, I don't think we need utilities to propel this market higher. Now, a few weeks ago, as I told everybody in my service last night, when we had energies and foods and utilities, and that was the that was the only game in town. And when I did my column, I guess a month or two ago, about what's propping up the peas, and that's the only thing that was holding up the whole market. Now, obviously, nice, it was nice enough for, or nicely, would have, have everyone look at it, but it was nice that all these other sectors decided to join in, such as the semis and the uh, financials and the banks and, and all these other areas began to join in and help to push the market higher, or at least keep the market 
at high levels. So it was good that all those areas began to join in. So now that those areas are here, in other words, the breadth of the market has increased. Now that breadth has increased, then I'm not so worried about one of these prior leaders beginning to crumble. And maybe uh, we'll look to short uh, something in utilities uh, really soon, though. For the most part, most areas have been improving as of late. Drugs and biotech making marginal new highs in here after trading a little bit sideways. As you can see, uh, teletransports are up towards new highs. They've begun to pull back in here. Uh, not the end of the world, but they are getting kind of whacked in here today. But if you look at the longer-term trend here, if I can get everything to work. You can see the nice breakout so far remains intact, and so far they're just kind of pulling back in here, so nothing to get too excited about there. So for the most part, sectors are looking pretty good in here. One thing I noticed yesterday has got me a little bit excited is the gold stocks are beginning to wake up. Now, if you look at the, the gold stocks overall, you won't be as impressed, but when you look at the individual issues, I'm seeing a few of these guys rally sharply off their lows, so maybe, just maybe, we'll get a new leg in some of these. I think ANV, yeah, earlier this year we had a nice, nice bow tie. I thought this was going to be the mother of all bottoms. I think we made a little bit of money on it, not enough to write home about, but a little bit. And then it rolled back over, but now we're making a brand new low in here, and you can go back uh, at least 10 years, I think, on this bad boy. Let's take a look at like a monthly chart on this, or yeah, okay. Well, you can go at least, you can go back six years at least to um, 2008. It wasn't that much lower back then. So this stock has the potential to make a major, major double bottom. So you wouldn't, um, you know, keep it on your watch list. It wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised, or it shouldn't surprise you. This could end up on a trading service really, really soon. Okay. Since the major indices are cap weighted, could you have a broad trim of the majority members, but the big caps on top are struggling? E miss out on the good uh, trends. Well, no, because what I do is I don't say I don't say oh the market looks looks funky. I'm not taking the setup now. I might be a little bit less inclined to take setups if the market's looking funky. But if I really really like a setup. I'm not going to worry about the market or even the sector. Yes, ideally, you want to look at the market, the sector, the, the uh, stocks within the sector, and you want all those pieces to fit. But if I start seeing some good setups, and I'm saying, like, I really, really like them, all those things we talked about in the stock selection webinar, then um, such as persistency, acceleration of trends, gaps in the direction of trends, expansion of range, no overhead resistance, the list goes on and on. If I start seeing all those characteristics in a particular setup, then I'm going to take it, okay? If this thing makes a bow tie off of eight, ten-year lows, whatever it is, six-year lows or whatever, and it's a good-looking setup, then I'm going to take it. So I hear what you're saying. Like if you just focus, if you focus too much on the indices, you might miss opportunities, and I agree with that. And that's why I look at 2,000 stocks a day, okay? But, yes, I do talk about the indices. I do look at what's going on. That Russell sometimes, the Rusty, can, can kind of help you get a feel for what's going on if you're not going to look at all those charts. But uh, I would strongly urge you to look at a lot of charts because here's the deal. If you were just running scans or looking at the indices and not paying a whole lot of attention, I don't think you would see that these there's some gold stocks in here wake it up. And because I look at so many charts daily, I have that advantage. And, and I'm not bragging because I got that advantage because you could do the same thing that I do. I'm not trying to. Say, you know, la-di-da, -da, look at me. You could figure out the same thing, too. So I think looking internally as I do, if there were a lot of opportunities, I would take them. Um, and, and I'm looking at a lot of stuff. It's like, hey, is uranium waking up or these rare earths waking up? Each day I look at a couple thousand stocks and I ask myself these questions. Actually, I don't ask the questions so much as I let the database tell me. And then yesterday I see gold stocks waking up a little bit in here. So kind of like a little hint, hint on that. Follow through will be key, okay? So, no, uh, Albert, I, I doubt that uh, we would miss those trends by looking at so many stocks, okay? Okay, Tom, I'll let me see what I could do um, the uh, in the future. If you could just give me one stock on a line at a time, uh, it would be easier uh, for me to keep up with what, what I worked on, what I have. Um, 
A couple of areas have come in in here, such as defense. But let's not get too excited just yet. For the most part, most areas are kind of hanging in there. And let's just see how everything shakes out. And again, one day at a time. This is sort of the first test that we've seen in the while. The only thing that's got me kind of bummed out is I would have preferred if this first test would have came uh, way up here after the market has already broken out to new highs in, in the Russell and in the NASDAQ. I don't want to see the test shy of the prior high in here, which would set up a possible double top. And again, not the end of the world if you got a double top. But if you got a double top with a bow tie or a double top with a first thrust, then you have to start being concerned. By the way, I don't want to digress too far, but that's one of the things that I, I read about in uh, Greg Morris's book, and we wrote about in a column a while back, his new book, Investing with the Trend. It's a good book, by the way. Um, and the point that one of the fund managers is making from stand-in is that, and I'm assuming this is what he's talking about, if you just blindly bought this market in 2009, and have been holding on to it, you look like a genius now at least. But what you got to realize is there's been some pretty scary times in between where the market looks like it was in a lot of trouble. And trust me, at some point in the future, you're going to have something that looks like this in the market. And guess what? It's going to be bigger than that. So that's one of the problems if you're, if you're going after a fund manager that has good, good performance. I would almost, you almost want to know what the fund manager is doing internally. And if the fund manager is not quite keeping up with this rip roaring longer term trend that we had, you need to find out was he trying to short or was he out of the markets during these periods when the market was sliding like that. And that's an important thing to, um, to ask. I don't know how I got digressed on that. All right, let's start looking at some, uh, let's look at some individual issues. We'll go ahead and open it up. All right, Tom, let me see what, how many I can get to. V and Q. Okay, this is a REIT, and uh, I'm not a huge fan of REITs because the volatility is really low, and this is a REIT ETF, so that creates a bit of an inefficiency problem. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, efficiency problem, okay? Uh, but it did break out or accelerate higher. Everyone looked at it. It pulled back, but it pulled back into the prior base. And I wonder if I have those slides in here. Um, I have some slides from, let's see if we could fix this, make this work. Let me see if I got some slides since we have time. I did a presentation, I think it was the day before yesterday, or I, everything's a blur lately. I keep myself busy on purpose because otherwise I'll squeeze off a day trade and do those things that I recommend you don't do. Uh, here we go. Let's see if I can find this. Uh, do I care if an ETF is open ended or closed ended? I didn't know an EP, you know, I, I didn't know an ETF. I don't trade ETFs that much, but I don't, I don't, I didn't know an ETF could be uh, closed ended. Wouldn't an open ended ETF be a mutual fund? Same thing. Uh, I did a presentation a couple of days ago, and in the presentation, a couple of things I talked about were returning to the base. You could see here that this, uh, the, in this figure, what I've illustrated is. You have a base. You want to see a stock break out and pull back and not pull back to the base. And this came right out of the stock selection webinar, by the way. I think this is from the teaser video. You don't want to see it take off and then come right back in. So if you look at that REIT ETF, what happened was it did just that. Notice it took off and came right back into the base. Okay. Now that plus efficiency, which we don't have enough time to get into today, uh, it's probably too efficient. Okay. Next is uh, EDV. EDV. Yeah, uh, this is, you draw your line here, and you could see that, or you could do this if you want. You could see that this really hasn't made much forward progress in a long, long time, especially depends on where you would draw your lines in here. And you could see it's only going 0.36. So there's no minimum, there's no momentum left in that one. Now, you're talking, some of these EW shares, yeah, are going to look a lot better. Um, Italy is one I've been looking at. You can see Italy broke out, although it didn't it didn't clear the prior highs as much as I would like. But so far, it's just kind of pulling back and hanging in there. Uh, that's kind of like that V-shaped recovery at high levels. I, not my favorite pattern in the world, but it looks okay. And I wouldn't trade this market unless it went up to make new highs and then maybe on the next pullback. UNP, UNP is going to be a big fat stock. Um, 
the volatility is low. It's got a HV of 13, so it's a little bit low. It doesn't move around. It looks like it moves around a lot, but that's from, from like here to here is like eight points, uh, which is not much on uh, the particular stock. It looks okay, uh, maybe on a pullback. Keep in mind that even with a lower volatility stock, something bad could always happen. I'd, I'd much rather be in a, in a somewhat thinner issue that has the potential to make a very large move over a short period of time as opposed to a big, thick issue that doesn't move much, but something bad, again, can still always happen to me. Okay, BA is going to be another fat one I'm not going to like. And Boeing has a lot of... Uh, it's got a lot of overhead supply to it. Notice it's kind of crawled up to this overhead supply, and then look what's happened. It's kind of stalling at that overhead supply. So I'm not a big fan of those big fat stocks. And finally, CAT. Um, CAT looks okay for a fat stock, but notice that it just kind of barely got past its prior highs in here before pulling back. So this would have to really accelerate higher and then pull back like that for me to get excited about that particular one. Okay. Hey, everyone, Don is here. And guess what stock Don wants to know about? He just he just likes to get beat up. Ford. Well, Ford's still got some overhead resistance. In shorter term, it looks okay. But it's got to get past this overhead resistance in here. And longer term, it's just kind of sideways at best. So but yet again this week, leave that one alone. Howard wants to know about Grub. GRUB. Well, one thing I've observed with IPOs is that not the offering price, because that's two different things. Not the offering price, but the the first trade price, your your after public market. Um, when they come public at higher price levels. They tend to be priced for perfection a little bit more than when they don't. So I would actually leave this one alone and wait for it to make new highs and then pull back before looking to do anything, okay? Hey, Dave, FSIC, what do you say? FSIC, oh, FSIC. Um, let's take a look at this. Well, what, what industry are they in? It looks pretty thick. And it hasn't moved much. It's only moved from 9 to 10. So I would give that a maybe above this high. The only thing is, in some particular cases, you want to, you want to make sure the company has some sort of potential. Now, pattern trumps everything, okay? So that's always going to be the caveat. But if I'm not really nuts about something, in this particular case, okay, it was trading around 10, 20, and it went up a whole half a point, okay? It sounds like an oxymoron, I guess. And then it had a knockout move. So it's not jumping out of me as the greatest pattern in the world. So I would dig a little further. I would dig a little further, and I would do a little tiny research on this company and find out, what they do. For instance, I was looking at um, GMAC financing this morning, and that one's going to make it into the to the um, that one's going to make it into the webinar, okay? Because it's a huge, thick stock, and even though it looks like it's all over the place, that's only like a one point move, and it came public above twenty bucks a share, which has some certain nuances to it. So this is probably an IPO that I wouldn't trade. So that was another kind of financial related IPO. Now again, pattern trumps everything. So I remember years ago I was being a, I was kind of being a smart smarty pants, for lack of a better word, and Lulu was set up and I made fun of them for making yoga clothes and then I watched them go up like forty percent over the next few days. So that was a valuable lesson for me in that uh, in lesson in fads and a lesson in that pattern always trumps everything else. If you're going to be a good little technician and you want to live a long and healthy life, then you learn how to read the charts. 
and you do exactly what they're saying. Now, if the charts are kind of mediocre, then it's okay to dig a little deeper and say, well, what sector is this company in, especially in the IPOs, and say, well, can they really be the next fad or fashion or technological development, okay? And you can start asking those questions. But if it's a beautiful setup, you take it, okay? Um, I'm long true right now, T-R-U-E, true car. I think that's going to be the biggest fly and die in the world. I think it's going to die out at some point, hopefully. I've already taken partial profits, but hopefully before, um, hopefully so I can get some um, trailing stop profits in, okay? So it's like you don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but if the pattern is there, you take it, okay? Tour, T-O-U-R, I have no idea what they do, but they had a beautiful little pattern there, and the stock just absolutely took off. So if the pattern is there, by all means, take it. If the pattern is not there, if it's looking a little mediocre, then it's okay to dig a little deeper, like this GMAC Capital Trust or whatever. It's a huge, thick, new company, but it's a new company, but there's no excitement to it, at least from where I stand. Now, if it doubles and pulls back or even goes up 50% and pulls back, then maybe I'll think about uh, trading it, okay? Dave, lack of volume, volatility in global markets these days is getting a lot of play in the press. Any thoughts on why that is happening? No, I, I try not to think too much, and I don't. The TV in my office is used as a big uh, screen monitor. I don't use it to watch um, any of the uh, those channels or anything. Kang, K-A-N-G, for ZM, K-A-M-G, K-A-N-G. NG. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. Um, when they have, when they kind of die out on a on a wide range bar like this from the open, ideally you want to see them get past that bar before you start thinking about trading them again. But yeah, on a pullback, I think that's um, I think this one definitely has um, potential, but not right now. It's not. I wouldn't say it's set up exactly right now. Okay. LQ has good pattern. <clears throat> yeah, we got a bad. Um, I got a bad tick in this. I'll have to pull it up in Metastock later and take a look at it. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, you know, you got to realize here's the deal. From here. All the way to here, that's only a two-point run, okay? So, it, it, it's, it's La Quinta Hotels. Now, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, because if the pattern is there, the pattern is there. But if you only have a two-point run and it's pulling back, then you got to think about it. You know, maybe, well, how great are La Quinta Hotels? Uh, you know, I don't know. A good place for a meth lab. <laughs> I'm half kidding. Somebody from La Quinta is going to call me up. G-S-A-T. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, nice little trend, but you're going to need a pullback, okay? And my only other concern would be that this thing has gone so far. I think this is in one of my momentum lists. It's gone so far that it might be priced for perfection. And that's the only problem with something like that. Um, it's just it's already going up. Yeah, see, it's here. It's already going up so much that it would be kind of dangerous to jump in. It's okay to have it in a portfolio, a big portfolio, or if you got it in a long time ago, then ride the trend. But once something is up 800, 900, 1,000 percent like this, whatever it is, it's a little dangerous to start trading it at those levels. Not that a trend can't go forever. Yeah, so we only got 40 percent in this one uh, over the last 26 days. But the reason I put it in so late in the trend into this momentum list is because I've got 100 stocks in here. If one of them dies, it's not going to kill the whole deal, okay? So, John, I would leave that one alone for now. It's just too dangerous. Matt wants to know about LNG. That's going to be a gas company. Um, I don't like the fact – it only had these two big up days in here. I like to see an extent – this is it within the core methodology now for established issues. It's a little bit different with IPOs, but for established issues, I like to see a little bit more follow-through than just one or two days. 
and then we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I, I, it looks okay in here. It's kind of making a flag. It looks okay. Uh, it's something that I wouldn't go after, though, because I don't like the two big days, and that's it. And then it's just kind of drifting along in here. Um, these natural gas stocks can be a real pain in the butts, too, pain in the buttocks, too. They can get a little squirrely and hard to trade. But I hear you. I just don't like the way – I just don't like those two big up days uh, as my gauge for momentum. I mean, if it worked its way up over a period of time. And also, you want to see acceleration higher. Let me see if I can get a blank chart. Um, up on the screen, if it's one in the background. Uh, let's see. You want to see a market ideally, especially on the breakout. And this is, um, I almost said, this is in my opinion. I'm always telling my children and my wife, you don't have to say in my opinion because if you're talking, you're giving an opinion. Anyway. I almost like to see a slight breakout and then an expansion of range like this as opposed to a breakout where you got an expansion of range and the expansion of range and then and then it starts to fizzle out, okay? I'd much rather see this and then the pullback than this, you know, one or two big bars and then that's it, okay? So I want to see some sort of acceleration higher and not just big pop in here. When you see a big pop like this, you have to ask yourself, has everybody rushed in at the same time? And is it done? GDXJ, that's going to be the gold miner juniors for Mr. Phil over in the great UK. GDXJ. Well, you've got the mother of all head and shoulders bottoms working there. So that's kind of cool to look at, okay? And then uh, let's put the bow ties in. And you're almost got a bow tie here. Now, I like bow ties off of all-time lows, but if you do like this, you can see, okay, close enough for government work. And it's also a huge head and shoulders bottom, and it's almost a bow tie. So got a little bit of bad memories right here. But, yeah, by all means, that could set up really soon. And that's what we saw yesterday at some of those gold stocks. So get ready to get ready on GDXJ and um, those individual goal stocks. Eric wants to know about code. Hello, Eric. It looks fantastic. Um, you've got some acceleration of trend. Notice that this kind of worked its way higher for a long, long time. And now what do you have? You've got acceleration of trend. So what do you want? You want to wait for the next pullback and then consider this possible stock. And it hasn't run up too, too much. Yeah, it's ran up 100% or more. It's, it's okay. It still looks good. So yeah, wait for a pullback and then continue um, and then think about that one. In fact, I should put that one. I don't think that's in my Landry 100. Uh, good eye on that one. That probably needs to go in there. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll keep an eye on, on it. And if it expands higher, I'll, I'll probably put it on the list. T-E-D-U for when... TDU. Uh, let's see. Well, you definitely got a. Um, I wonder if this is the real. One thing I found with telecharts is that the new issues, this is wrong. So be careful. Make sure you go check out what the company actually does. Um, I like the fact that this stock is broken out, as I said earlier, or at a nauseam. Um, IPOs do have a wonderful breakout characteristic to them. So if this stock is going to C, where C is um, 20 bucks a share, it's already went through B at 10 bucks a share. Uh, but what I would do, since it's already broken out decisively, is I would wait for the next pullback on that one. Good eye, though. A high five for being a, having a good eye. R E D F. And you're already long. Ooh, that's too crazy. That's a crazy one. Um, this one shot up, and then it came all the way back in. I've got one of these crazy ones on here, too. I know. IGC right here. Okay. This is on the momentum list. This one's not quite as crazy as that other one, though. Um, well, maybe not. HV-wise, it is. Um, I mean, I see. I, I don't know what you did, but it's just so volatile and dangerous to trade. It's also kind of all over the place. 
I hear you, though. Uh, India's bottomed out. India's been looking pretty good. And this is an Indian company, obviously. Uh, I would trade it just because it's too wide, loose, longer term. But I think I see what you did. I think you played that that break out of that pullback. Um, I would look around and see if there's anything else that's a little bit more cleanly. If you feel like you need that, uh, if you need that um, exposure to India. Okay, Doc Lee. Haven't seen you in a while, Doc. How you been? SBGL. Oops. SBGL. Uh, question is, is it price for perfection or should it be watched for resumption of uptrend? No, this is actually a short. If you go in and look at my, I guess you can't go in and look at my list. Um, but if you look at my recent Landry list, you'll see I had, uh, this was in was a buy, and then this one was a short back on 612. So let's go back to 612. I'm sorry, 69. Yeah, so right around here we had as a short. So that's not price for perfection. That's actually a short. Okay, uh, a couple things to notice. In fact, we can go back to these slides, ironically, that we used just yesterday, which is kind of cool. Let's see if we can get them up. This was, um, I talked a little bit about the um, stock selection, or two days ago in the webinar. Um, notice that the, an ideal world, you want a stock to thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back. These are slides, again, taken straight from the stock selection webinar. And you don't want them to pull back, thrust, and then pull back, to the level of the prior pullback. Now keep that pattern in your mind's eye and let's pop over to pop back into the charts okay and it's kind of on a huge picture scale but notice what the stock did okay it broke out it kind of had this major pullback here and then it broke out and then it pulled back to its prior pullback okay so that's a red flag so this is the first thrust pattern right around 10 bucks a share and then if you wasn't if you weren't sure again always look at the chart first and then think about what's going on in the charts take a good look at the charts and then throw your moving averages in and I, I have not plotted them on this particular stock up until now and you can see ah the moving averages have begun to roll over and have begun to cross over so it's definitely not a stock that you would be want to buying that you would want to buy at this juncture okay so yeah it's probably done it's probably priced for perfection. G L N G G L N G. We got several mats in here today. So welcome mats. G L N G. Uh welcome mats. Hey, that's funny. <laughs> uh it's a little wide and loose. I I'm not a big fan of shipping stocks. In fact, we're actually short of shipping stock right now. Uh it's not working out for us though. Um it's looks like it's headed higher. It 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 doesn't trade real cleanly. It trades in kind of like chunks. It kind of breaks out and consolidates and breaks out and consolidates and breaks out and consolidates. If you're long, stay long. If you're not long, maybe wait for the next pullback. I just don't like chip, shipping stocks. Shipping stocks in general I find to be really choppy, and it's hard to catch decent trends in them and, and, and stay with them at least. Okay, LNG we talked about. How about ATHL? Notice that it is in your 100 list. Okay, ATHL. Um. Yeah, uh, on pullbacks though. Okay, so it's it's a momentum stock. And that's why it's in the list, but maybe on a pullback. So it's going to have to, and maybe with a little bit more acceleration higher. Okay, and then on the next pullback, yeah, by all means. Code for Mr. John. C O D E. Good to see you, John. Yeah, we talked about that one. Next pullback, or we talked about it last week. Next pullback could be uh, worthwhile. Just talk about that one. AUK, AUQ, that's going to be a gold stock, AUQ. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's getting there. It's getting there. Um, definitely, it's at, uh, let's take a look at the monthly chart. We should get hotkey to monthly. Well, it's not at, I think I'd find something that's at, at more major lows. Eh, it's major enough. You go back to 2003. So that's 10-year lows. It's coming off of 10-year lows. It's bow tying or should bow tie soon. 
it's not set up yet though but yeah it should set up soon one thing to um one thing to know is that with a gold or a commodity type or a gold is a commodity obviously but a commodity type of stock i'm a little bit more lenient with the patterns and i'm not looking for as much perfection but ideally i do want to see him making major major lows before i go in and uh, trade them. Miss Karen wants to know about NVO. NVO. Hey Karen, haven't seen you in a while. How you been? Um, well, there's nothing for me here. It's a high, it's a high level bow tie, but I'm not a big fan of bow ties at high levels uh, for the long side, at least. It's a foreign stock. It's a little squirrely. Um, I don't know if it, if it broke out to brand new highs, maybe on a pullback, but it doesn't jump out at me. It's something that I'm excited about AGN getting tired hold small long position from 133 AGN AGN getting tired well hopefully you've cashed out of some of that position I think that I hope that was on my Landry list I forget I think it was hopefully you cashed out I may have already cashed out of it I, I had you know I was keeping a, a used list not a used list but what stocks that were prior winners or losers from the list, and then um, I got a phone call the other day. I tried to multi-process, and I accidentally deleted it. So now I've got to go back to my paper copies to find out what got deleted and when. But I think this one might have been in there, and I'm not sure when I added it. Um, hopefully, you took some partial profits on this one, and you have a stop in mind. I don't know if it's a buyout or not, but just have a stop in mind. I, I definitely would not buy any more at this juncture, okay? But if you took partial profits, okay, you're probably okay. Y-O-D, bow tied. Y-O-D. Y-O-D. Yeah, it's sloppy, though. Um, it's kind of a sloppy bow tie. It's kind of all over the place. It looks like it can trade thinly at times. So I think I would pass on that one. V-R-N-G. V-R-N-G. I think that was for Vern. Um. No, it's just you know, it's just draw your line, draw your arrow. It hasn't done anything in years, so that does not uh, really fit the methodology. And also, you've got a tremendous amount of overhead support. Okay, so you either want to find we need two things uh, to fit the methodology. One of those things would be trend. Another one of those things would be an obvious transition in the trend. So you want to either see something where you can draw an arrow like the back of my business card or you want to see some sort of major transition to trend like these gold stocks coming off of like 10 year lows or something before getting too excited about a stock you don't want to see a stock that goes sideways even here sideways shorter term where I've drawn an end where it's come back to its prior little pullback okay and I think if you go back two slides somewhere you also want to see uh, an acceleration of trend like this, and again, this is straight from the stock webinar, and not a deceleration of trend. And of course, you don't want your stock to look like an electrocardiogram, right? And then if you take a look at that one, not to beat you up in case you're new to the program. See, I could beat up Don because he's he should know better. Um, but this is going mostly sideways, and you've got a lot of overhead supply in here. In fact, if we get to slide number... 41 this is another bad thing kind of giving you a free lesson in here um, you got overhead supply okay so even if the stock does begin to rally it's going to run into problems when it hits that overhead supply all right mr. Phil wants to know about NGD 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 yeah, I mean, Phil, you you know, you're under these goals, and that's fantastic. But you need to wait for them to set up. But yeah, they could set up soon. I'm 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 excited. I'm glad to see something moving out there. Okay. But yeah, wait for your setup. Don, let's know about Twitter. Well done. Draw your arrows. Looks like a downtrend to me. Now it has tried to bottom out a little bit in here so maybe after your bow ties Jonathan do you know for a fact of those uh, you were asking about closing versus opening ETFs um, I think all ETFs or most ETFs if they have to 
they could they could they could all make shares if they have to um by i guess buying more of the companies that make them up or i forget how they do it i mean it's it's a problem i don't have i have a friend who runs billions of dollars and and he could even trade fairly thin ETFs i think they actually make a market for him in those he lets them know what they what, they, what he wants to do and they put together the the ETFs and buy them so i don't know if you consider that open ended or not um Long ENG would add on a pullback. ENG, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's fine. It looks like it can be thin at times. It's pretty thin. Yeah, I hear you. It's definitely trending. I can't argue with that. ZM wants to know about NADL. NADL. Yeah, that was the mother of all breakouts in that one. Um, it's not bad. I prefer if it didn't have this gap, and it's going to need a little bit, eh, just, well, a little tiny more pullback. But it's not bad. Maybe a little bit more pullback. Uh, John, yeah, the answer is yes, but then it's, uh, it's, it's let me show you this one. CXDC. This was one that was on my lander list back here. And the question is, is it a TKO? And, yeah, I showed it as a TKO coming into today. Um, if it pulls back much further, though, it's going to be questionable. My only problem with this one is, is it's ran up from like four bucks, thirteen bucks. So it's like four hundred percent or three hundred percent, depends on where you count from. So it's probably priced for perfection. That's the only thing that's got me a little nervous there, and that's why I didn't go with it as a setup uh, coming into today. I showed my peeps at last night. Nice little TKO move. Nice little a uh, textbook TKO, uh, of course. But because it's sort of priced for perfection, I decided to leave it alone. Now it's kind of a deep pullback. I think it's still tradable, but I think it's, it would be very dangerous. So, I mean, yes or no? No. Long PES, the exposure stage, two stocks, PES. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's still in a trend. It's, it, it hasn't done much lately, though. It's kind of just kind of crawled higher, but yeah, it's not it's not doing anything wrong, and and the moving averages, which just happen to be left over in here, look pretty good. So, AA, you know, AA did pretty well a while back. Um, it's okay. Um, yeah, it's not bad. Uh, maybe on it just it doesn't move around that much. This breakout here, if this breakout would have been a little bit more impressive, okay, and that's the problem with AA, it just doesn't move around that much. And then you had the pullback. I'd be more excited about it. For the most part, when stocks drop below 30 or so on the HV, I'm not as excited about them as when they're a little bit higher. Okay. STV. STV. Uh, I don't know if we talked about this one or not, but, yeah, on pullbacks, maybe. Um, kind of crazy. Yeah, maybe on a pullback. And I have to follow through a little bit more than what it's done so far. Notice you got that one big bar. Remember, like I said, remember what I said earlier about one bit, one or two big bars on a breakout. You want to see some sort of follow through, also some sort of acceleration. Uh, XLS for MK. XLS. I'm going to delete the rest of those. Well, I guess I could. I guess I'll try to get to them. Uh, if you're thinking about shorting this stock, yes. If you're thinking about buying it, I think it's a bad idea. Um, it's trying to turn a corner, but I don't like to buy stocks at mid-levels like this when you're fighting that major possible trend on the downside. It's true, I am long, full disclosure. Key, true. Oops. Okay. And uh, today, notwithstanding, it looks pretty good. In fact, if it pulls back a little bit more in here, which I hope it doesn't, I think it could be a very viable setup. That's a second, that's a second tier setup. Your first tier setup would have been around here on a breakout, and then now that it's broken out, your second tier setup is uh, setting up in here. So maybe on a tiny bit more pullback, um, or one more, at least one more day in the pullback, uh, I think it could be worthwhile. So yeah, keep an eye on that. Maybe I'm talking my position, but who knows. MTL took off yesterday. Uh, this is for Phil. And, yeah, I think it's bottoming out. You know, the problem with this one is 
it's got a mountain of overhead resistance. So for me to get excited, I would actually have to get past this overhead resistance. And after that, I might think about it. DXM. 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 Um, well, for me to get excited about it, it would have to bang out new highs and then maybe pull back. But right now, there's nothing to really trade on that one. BPZ. 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 Okay, let's try again. BPZ. What am I fat fingering? B. P Z. Finally. Um, is that British Petroleum? It would have to make new highs and then pull back for me to get excited about it. Um, there's no structure at this point that I see that jumps out at me. Um, yeah, so I'd have to do something like that and then look to play pullback along the way. But right now, I don't think so. CRZO. Carazo, oil and gas. Uh, maybe on a pullback, but right now. But I do like the way it's kind of accelerating higher. But yeah, on a pullback. Okay. MEI or JMEI? Okay. Yeah, on a pullback, I think that looks pretty good. I think it has a um, potential. Okay. RIGL. Getting hungry. RIGL. Um. Oh, my stomach is growling. I wonder if you can hear it. Uh, it's got bad memories, but they're a long time ago and a long ways away. Well, it would have to get above five before I would be interested in it, just based on the chart. And by the time you got above five, then you got this big old gap back here to deal with. So I would pass just based on that, okay? Pizza. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if people start uh, naming food stocks. <laughs> ODP. We just kind of snuck up on me. It's like, oh, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. I'm starving. Um, no, uh, it's just kind of all over the place. It would have to bust out the new highs for me to get excited about it. It's just it's nothing there for me, Howard. AMKR. That should be in my Landry list, I think. Let's just see for S and Gs. Let's see how smart Big Dave is. Or not. Landry list on Landry 100. 100. Sometimes if you ask me nicely, I'll give you my Landry 100. Look at that. I got him a Landry 100. Um, yeah, maybe it'll pull back. Let's see if it's priced for perfection. Oh, I don't know. It's had a pretty good run. So that's the only problem. That's where my dilemma comes in. And I love trend, and I love trading trend. I'm a big proponent of it, but when a stock runs four or five hundred percent before it pulls back, it's okay to keep it in your momentum list, but you're much better off trying to find it like right here uh, as opposed to at such high levels and get a little TKO type of move, a little uh, double top. Well, not really a TKO, but kind of a pullback from a double top knockout. SLV, that's going to be silver. And it's going to be a very efficient type of market. But when an efficient type of market begins to bottom out, sometimes you can capture a nice move. Support is about a year and with risk resistance at 2010 looks do low risk. Spot he wants to buy it around 18. Um well what I would do is wait for a bow tie and then maybe think about it. And even better would be to trade the silver stocks versus the underlying commodity. Okay. All right. Stop mentioning food. L N L L N W L L N W. Uh, maybe in a pullback. It's kind of crazy. I did see this one. I think this one's actually. Man, lo and behold, look at that. It's in my Landry list because it started breaking out from low levels. Okay. Uh, but maybe on a pullback in here, it might be worthy. CMCM, CMCM is going straight up. 
Okay. Um, yeah, and the next pullback, sure, by all means. Uh, that was one that was in the uh, list of stock. This is this is one that might be exemplary of the fact that we're still in a um, bull market for IPOs. Gene says, where do you draw the line on price perfection? I understand the general concept. Well, that's a tough that's a tough thing to, to, to really say, but if it's up four or five hundred percent and um, let's say the sector's been in a, in a three year bull market or four year bull market, and then let's say the overall market gets a little sideways or iffy or starts consolidating, then you have to wonder if that stock could become a source of funds. And the other problem that that happens with high relative strength, it's another source of funds problem too. It's just the opposite. It's kind of darn if you do and darn if you don't. Let's say the market begins to take off in general. Well, some of those lower tiered stocks, like you notice how we see these gold stocks that are taking off? Some of those gold stocks are going to get bought up, and the fund managers, in order to buy those gold stocks, they're going to sell some of those high flyers. So it can be a case that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. If you really like a setup, sometimes you've got to close your eyes and take it, okay? And that's what we did in, in Zen is okay it's set up again look pretty good so you just kind of have to you have to sometimes follow your technicals and take them there's nothing wrong i would never fault you for buying a stock that's priced for perfection it's just sometimes i get a little cautious and i'm a little concerned about doing that kind of thing so it's a it's a discretionary call and that's kind of tough okay uh grh grh hope that helps a little uh this looks kind of thin this is too thin um, it's only trading like, um, oh, I don't know. It's it's, it's super thin. Eighty nine hundred shares, eighty nine thousand, eighty nine hundred. Um, and then there's no real structure here. Maybe if it broke out, maybe look to play a pullback. Uh, do you have a specific ETF you want me to look at for uh, natural gas, BOIL, maybe? Um, it's just kind of choppy in here. I mean, everybody's been looking for a bottom in natural gas forever. Someday it will, uh, well, that's an ultra one. Someday it will take off again, but it's just been kind of choppy. What's another natural, uh, which uh, uh, it escapes me at the moment. NATURAL gas. Let's see what this looks like, the index. Well, the index looks pretty good. The ETFs don't look too good. Boil, yeah, I just looked at boil. It's kind of wide and loose. RMBS, that's going to be a thick stock. Um, well, you've got bad memories throughout. I mean, it rallies up, and then it implodes, and then now it's pushing back into the um, to the area. There's another stock like this. I'm trying to think of its name, the name of it. It's like, isn't there like some stocks out there, and they're always like uh, the latest computer, latest iPhone or whatever is going to use their chips and then they change their mind, and then they're going to use their chips, and then they change their mind. And it just makes for a horribly tradable instrument, or I should say horribly untradable instrument. Yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, STPFQ. I don't know if I, yeah, I can't pull that one up, Phil, on the fly. SKH. All right, a couple of more, and we'll have to start wrapping it up. Um... Well, longer term, it's kind of sideways. And if we zoom in a little bit, I mean, I hear you, it's kind of turned a corner. It would have to break out past these highs, but it's a little too wide and loose longer term. LQ for Mr. Howard, who's waited patiently for 45 minutes. Oh, yeah, we talked about that one. That's the Quinta. <laughs> Beth Lab. <laughs> oh, I'll probably get some hate mail for that one. Uh, yeah, this one's kind of interesting. This is kind of a fascinating breakout type of strategy that took a while to trigger in an IPO. Um, but, yeah, a little bit more pullback, even though it's got the gap in here. Maybe on a little bit more pullback, it might be worth a shot. Okay. Well, I think I better wrap things up. We're right around the cusp of where the recording gets a little hard to manage, right about an hour and a half or so. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. As usual, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule. To be here, I am honored by your presence and uh, very much flattered. 
Uh, I learn a lot in the process of doing this. So from the selfish standpoint, thank you for teaching me so much. So uh, I appreciate you guys showing up. Um, any questions, DavidDaveLandry.com. And I guess we'll talk again, uh, see you guys next Thursday if we don't uh, talk in the meantime. So thank you so much, and everybody enjoy the weekend if we don't talk in the meantime.